Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the presentation of the Backhuis Rosenbaum Medal 2023 and the Gilles Holst Medal 2023. I also welcome the people that are following this online. We have almost a full house here in the Timbergen Zaal, and I guess you at home also have a full house. Um, my name is uh, Tom van der Steen. I'm a member of uh, the board of the KNW. I'm also the chairman of the domain Natural and Technical Sciences, and I have the honor to guide you through this afternoon. We have uh, two medals. Backhuis Rosenbaum Medal 2023 will be presented to Professor Shlomo Havlin from uh, Bar Ilan University in Israel, and the Gilles Holst Medal 2023 will be presented to uh, Petra de Jong from uh, Utrecht University. So, what are we going to do this afternoon? Um, first, we're going to get a welcome by uh, our president, Marilene van Dochterom. Uh, then we will have a laudatio from the chairman of the uh, Backhuis uh, Rosenbaum Medal. Then we will have a presentation of the medal, and then we'll have a lecture by the laureate. Then we'll have a break, and then we'll repeat the same procedure for the uh, Hillis Holst Medal, so you know what you can expect this afternoon. Can I give the floor to our president, Marilijn Dochterom? Thank you very much, Tom. Yeah, and I'll, I'll try to be brief, because of course you're here to listen to our uh, laureate uh, today. Uh, but it's also my pleasure to welcome all of you on behalf of the Academy of Arts and Sciences. Uh, a special welcome, of course, to our laureate, uh, Professor Shlomo Havlin. Also, his wife and daughter are here. Um, I'm very glad that you could make it and be here uh, in this room with us today. Uh, also, to uh, Professor Petra de Jong and uh, her, her uh, husband, also a member of ours. I don't know if he's here yet. Detlef, <laughs> he will come at some point. <laughs> Uh, I would like to also welcome the people who nominated uh, these laureates for the prize. Uh, you know who you are. Uh, uh, welcome and also already big thank you to the uh, uh, chair of our jury, Professor Ralf Weijers, and also the other jury members, Jana Reuthova and Hans Hilgekoop, who both actually are not able to be here. One is traveling and the other we just found out is ill today, uh, but it's, uh, it's a, a very important job that the jury is doing for all our process, so thank you very much. It's hard work, it's also fun, I think, to uh, be able to do this. I want to also uh, welcome all the other members uh, of our Academy, uh, and of course all the colleagues, friends, family, uh, and other interested uh, of the uh, work of the laureate uh, today. So let me briefly tell you a little bit about our academy. Welcome to our house. This is our house. Uh, the Netherlands Academy of Arts and Sciences has members from all um, parts of sciences. Today, today we celebrate two medals that we give out in the domain of natural and technical sciences, as Tom already said. We also have members from the medical sciences and the social sciences and humanities. And uh, as an academy, this house uh, also is a house to our young academy and the Academy of Artists. So we, uh, in addition to these um, uh, memberships, we have a formal role to our government, an advisory role, and, and this not everybody knows, we're responsible for 10 research institutes and two institutes for research infrastructure. Today is our fourth role, you could say, and this is to hand out prizes where we honor achievements in science, and it's one of the best things uh, in, uh, that I get to do in this role as president. Uh, and also uh, today is special because we're handing out two medals and each of them is handed out only once every four years. So not every president gets to hand out these medals. And it's also in my own domain of science, so I'm very honored uh, to be able to do that today. Uh, a little bit of uh, historic information about the two medals. So the first, a uh, Backhaus Rosenbaum medal, uh, we, it's more than 100 years that we have this medal. It was installed um, uh, in the name of uh, Professor Backhaus Rosenboom, who was a chemist uh, in Amsterdam. And shortly after he passed away in 1907, uh, this uh, medal was installed in his uh, honor. And it's for uh, achievements in the area of uh, phase theory, as we will learn more about later. And it's uh, for an international scientist who is a renowned scientist internationally known who uh, provides an important contribution to phase theory in general, which is about the phase behavior in all kinds of materials, classic and quantum. You can go to our website and find out about the impressive list of names of previous laureates if you're interested. 
uh, there's a similar story for the gillis holz medal. It was installed a bit later, although we had some discussion about exactly when, but I think Peter maybe will mention uh, this. It was first awarded in 1963. Uh, it was installed in honor of the physicist um, and also a member of our academy, just like uh, Bakars Rosenbaum was. Uh, it was first uh, awarded in 1963. But what we are not so sure about is uh, maybe the, uh, he was uh, the director of the Nut Lab, worked at Philips. And uh, some stories say that it was installed at the occasion of his 25th um, year of working at Philips Nut Lab. But maybe there are some people here in the room who know uh, for sure, because this was in 1939, much earlier than 1963. Anyway, uh, every four years we've been handing out this medal, and it's, uh, uh, this is awarded to a scientist who is working in the Kingdom of the Netherlands. So it's more of a national prize, um, and it's for an, a scientist who has uh, shown great achievements uh, in the uh, area of uh, applied physics or chemistry, and uh, we like it even better when it's at the interface of these two uh, disciplines. So again, welcome very much to our house. Uh, I hope you will enjoy this afternoon and the rest of the time will be about our two laureates. Thank you. May I give the floor to Rolf Weijers? Thank you everyone for being here. Um, and uh, a small word of caution uh, at the start. I am by profession an astronomer, and that means that any semblance of expertise of myself in the field of the two laureates that is going to appear from the laudatios I will read are entirely due to my colleagues in the jury who are more expert in the field. I was more the slightly external voice in it. So dear colleagues, friends, and family of today's laureates, as the chairman of the jury, I'm honored to introduce the laureate of the Bakhuis Rosenbaum Medal 2023, Shlomo Havlin, professor of physics at Bar Ilan University in Israel, who is our guest today. The Bakhuis Rosenbaum Medal was initiated by the Royal Netherlands Academy of Arts and Sciences to honor its erstwhile member Hendrik Bakhuis Rosenbaum, who became famous in the late 19th century for his phase equilibrium theory. The medal is awarded every four years to a researcher who has made a groundbreaking contribution to phase theory from the Netherlands or anywhere else in the world. The Bakhuis Rosenbaum Medal is prestigious, but it will have to share space in Shlomo's display case with quite a few equally illustrious accolades, um, such as the Order of the Star of Italy, the Distinguished Science Award of the Chinese Academy, and the Lilienfeld Prize of the American Physical Society, among many others. No wonder. Shlomo has been one of the world's top pioneering scientists in the field of statistical physics and phase transitions for over 50 years. One of his major contributions is that he extended the theoretical concept of single network systems. The world is much more complex than can be grasped in a single network work, he apparently thought. Networks in nature usually do not operate in isolation, but are dependent for their functioning on other networks. So he developed a theory of interdependent networks, or networks of networks, which kick-started an entirely new research field. In a famous 2010 Nature article, Shlomo and his co-author showed that when different types of network are interconnected, abrupt phase transitions can occur. This contrasts with single standalone networks where phase transitions tend to be gradual and continuous. Moreover, besides phase transitions, the networks of networks theory is key to understanding a range of phenomena, not only in nature, but also in society. Electric power infrastructures, transportation networks, protein networks, ecological food webs, and climate phenomena. A grasp of such interdependent networks elucidates how a failure in a, network, in a few network nodes may lead to quick collapse of a whole network of networks, a, catastroph a catastrophic cascade of failure. 
Horrifying though it may sound, the underlying mathematics behind this concept is hugely influential. It is, for instance, a cornerstone in the design, management, and control of reliable, resilient, and robust infrastructures on which our society increasingly depends. The interdependent network theory is just one highlight. Shlomo's innovations are extremely broad, original, and deep. He developed numerous other creative ideas that have opened up new avenues of research. A few more examples are his theories on diffusion in disordered media, percolation, anomalous transport, long-range correlations in DNA, scaling laws in nature and traffic as a phase transition. Shlomo is versatile enough to venture outside of his core fields into meta-science. A recent preprint he co-authored described how disruptive papers in science are gradually losing their impact. That is to say, the correlation between how innovative and groundbreaking a scientific paper is on the one hand, and how often it is cited on the other hand, shows a decreasing trend. As a consequence, there are fewer and fewer game-changing papers that attract the attention of the scientific community. An explanation that Shlomo and his co-authors suggest is that because of the increasing information overload in academia, fewer scientists can read all of the relevant papers in their field so that they allow themselves to be guided by the choices of other scientists. Ooh, that's very pernicious. Thus, papers that are already well cited become even more highly cited and disruptive papers may remain relatively unnoticed. This is a trend that should give us food for thought. We can only be grateful that the co-author of the paper that uncovers this trend has himself been an exception to it in his long and fruitful career. For Shlomo Havlin has been both ground groundbreaking and highly cited. Shlomo. I hope that future generations of scientists such as you will continue to thrive and feed us with their brilliant ideas. The jury deems you an excellent candidate for the Backhuis Rosenbaum Medal 2023. And I now give the floor to our president, Marilyn Dochteron. And we have to look at the photographer, I think. Yeah. <laughs> I know my job. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is yours. Thank Congratulations. You. You uh, congratulations. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's also we have a picture with Ralph also, the jury chair. Thank you. Thank you very much. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Shall I take it from you? Yeah. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank Can I invite you to give a presentation? Thank you, everyone, for coming here. First, I want to thank you for the introduction. After I heard you, I think I don't need to be here because you told everything about me. You know better than me what I did. So it was really a very nice uh, presentation. Before uh, I start my talk, and let me see how I can make it. I think here, yeah, okay. Before I start my talk, let me say something about my country where I lived, where I, where I was born, and I lived for uh, all, ye all my years, you know, I'm over 80 years. And, uh, and I want uh, to thank first to the honor that I got uh, for the Backhouse Rosenbaum uh, Medal from the, this uh, respective uh, Royal Netherlands Academy of, Sci of, Science, uh, of Arts and Sciences. And to, especially to Marilyn, who called me the president of this uh, academy who called me, and I was excited because I, I almost did not know, I didn't know that somebody nominated me. So it was really a surprise when, when you called me. So thank you very much. Now, I, ca I came this time for, to Netherlands. I came several times before, but this time I came from a wounded country. My country is in war, as you know, state of Israel. Israel was attacked 
during a holy holiday by the by terrorist organization of Hamas on, on October 7, the attack was as similar a surprise as the September 11 attack of Al-Qaeda attack on the United States. We didn't know anything is going to come. And the, the war that we have is, was forced to us by Hamas. We did not, Israel does not want a war. And the war was when they killed, uh, kidnapped innocent babies, children, women, and elderly people. In Israel, it was felt, I want to tell you, like a one-day Holocaust. It was like a Holocaust. You know, it was ten, a tenth of a percent of the population were killed in one day. It's not a, it's a, it's a big a number for us. 1,400 people were killed. Israel, as I said, is not interested in war, but we are the only country for the Jewish nation and Israel had no choice but to defend its people so that mass murder will never again occur. So I will start now with my talk. Thank you for coming. And the, and the title of my talk, as you said, as you read, in Interdependent Superconducting Networks, Novel Phases, and Phase Transitions. And in this talk, I'm... Uh, I speak about, um, also about the history, I, how I reached this discovery. And I think it's a good uh, lesson to other people, to students, to other people to, to do, to follow this direction. So I will tell you my, a little my history. Before 2000, I worked mainly in physics, statistical physics. Only in the network theory, was uh, known to be like graph theory. It was very mathematical object. As you see here, this is the network. Network uh, was uh, assumed to be nodes and links. And, uh, and the number of links per node were, was followed a Poissonian function, which means that you can have a few links per node, but not a big, uh, broad range of uh, number of links per node, which is called the green. Only in 2000, it's related to the development of the computational, people started to study real network, like the internet. Before this, we could not upload the internet on the computer. The computers were poor, and we did not have so much space and to analyze the internet. When people started to analyze the internet, which means the computers, how, to which computer every computer is connected by cables, it was realized that the structure is very different from this structure. And the difference is that you have not only, uh, the, that you have al almost the same number of links per node like here, two, three or so, but you have also nodes which are very highly connected, like this red, we call them now hubs. And this was found by three computer scientists and the name of the uh, three, br three brothers their name, the name of the paper is Faluzos, Faluzos, and Faluzos. Three brothers named Faluzos. They say, look, we study the internet, and we could not find Poissonian. This was in about 2000, and this brought to me, I, I came from physics, to learn that the structure is very different, and the symmetry breaks from year to year. Why the symmetry? What kind of symmetry? It's symmetry of translation. Here, you see from every node, almost the same neighborhood, two, three, four nodes neighboring. Here, the symmetry breaks. From here, you see only one node, but from here, you see many nodes. And we know from physics, from uh, phys statistical physics, when the symmetry breaks, the laws change. And then we started to write papers, what are the laws here? And this was one step in the breakthrough. So I came to network. Uh, I started 2000 my papers in network, which are not even here because these are much earlier. And then in 2010 came to us an officer of research in the army of the USA and asked us, he said, you study, and many people studied until 2010, 10 years, only networks as a single unit, single network which are isolated, which are not 
connected to other network. But this is not true. The, in, the, in the real life, network are dependent on other networks, and they connect to other networks, like electricity and transportation, they connect to each other, uh, communication and, and electricity. And one needs to, and then I realized that one needs, I, re, I realized with my group of researchers that I collaborate, that we need to make a theory for a network of networks. Like here, for example, one could be a power grid, other communication, transportation, service, everything. I mean, but they are depend on each other. So we introduced, and this was the key issue, we introduced new, new type of links. New type of links. The links in the networks, we call them connectivity links. And the links between the network, we call them dependency, which means that a node in one network depends on this node and this node in the other network which means that if this fails, this will also fail. You can have both directions or one direction, but the result will be completely similar. So we made a theory for network or network which did not exist before, and, uh, and this was in 2010. But when I made this theory, and uh, I will show you some results about this theory, I want to tell the full story, I, I realized already that this introducing two types of links we can introduce also in physics two types of interactions. Link is kind of interaction, and if we make two types of interactions, we can do maybe physical systems in which we will see the two types of interaction phenomena that we see also here. And then we take two, we, I, I convince my collaborator, uh, Aviad Friedman here, who is experimentalist, he dealt only for one he dealt only of uh, always studied one superconducting network, this one, and he found that, of course, everyone knows that at low temperature it is superconductor, and above it it becomes a conductor. And I told him, look, let's put them together, and in between we put a layer which conducts heat but do not conduct electricity. It means you need to have another interaction. One is the electricity in each layer, and the heat can go from one layer. The idea was that uh, if one superconductor becomes a conductor, it produces heat because it becomes it has a resistance, and the heat can follow to the other. So finally, he did this, and this is the paper that we have here, that we have now physics of interdependent superconductor networks. So I came from networks, and finally in 2003, it took me 23 years to come back to physics, I told you here I was working in physics. Here I didn't work in physics, not only me. All people that went to work on network, they stopped physics because we could not find a way to apply network theory to physics. Only here we applied and we found this. So, and here we found new phenomena, new phases, new type of phase transitions, which is related to the price that, that uh, you honored me today. So today, you see, we got a, a, a mono to get the Bachaus Rosenbaum Prize, who, uh, as you know, studied uh, in these years, when he was uh, uh, before even 1900, uh, phase transition. Phase transition is a very simple phenomenon. He studied mostly on, me on metals, phase transition and alloys, and this is a phase transition, famous phase transition. In low temperatures, you have solid, in high temperature, it becomes liquid, and in very low, uh, and then you can have in low pressure, you can have gas. So you have gas, liquid, and this. And when we looked on our system, we see a very similar. Even the colors are similar. You see, we have yellow here, red, and we see also a phase diagram. Very, in general, it's very similar to this, and we see rich phenomena that could not be seen in one layer because of the two types of interactions. One interaction is the electricity that goes in each layer, and the heat that can follow from one layer to the other. And we see here, this is a superconductor regime. Now what we do here, in the, we, will do, we, we are going to do the experiment, is that we can control the heat that will not come everywhere to the system, only a, at a certain range of temperature, and then we predict a very rich phenomena to have a superconductor phase, normal phase, and a metastable phase. So 
let me tell you now more details what I told you now in, in, uh, in uh, two slides. So as I told you, people from 2010 to, till, uh, from 2000 to 2010, people studied only single isolated networks, many books and thousands of articles on a single network. But as I told you, single network do not exist almost in nature, so one needs to study uh, to study interconnected uh, network. And, and indeed, if you look on the real engineering, they tell you how interdependent are infrastructures. You cannot just study the electric grid power, oil, water, and telecom, communication, and everyone depends on another. You see, this is a Piper 2001, but there was no tool, no mathematical model to study such complex system that everyone is a network, but the networks depend on each other, as I showed you before, as you can see, you can see here, you can see here, this is the model that we start to, I wanted to study, to study a model for interdependent networks. And indeed, it's, it's, it exists in life, but there was no tool, no mathematical model, no tool for this. So, and uh, more than that, we know phenomena that occur because interdependency, because dependency of the, of the power grid in Italy and the communication that controls the power grid. What happened in Italy in, in 28th of September 2003, and one of my students came from Italy, he was a child, he remembered this day, every, every Italian remembered 28th of uh, September because there was no electricity in the whole country for more than one day. And the reason was because of the interaction between, this was found in this paper by engineers, because of the failure of some power stations, there was a failure in communication, I came back to the power stations, and finally the system broke down and they stopped electricity in all Italy. And it, not only for uh, power, power grid, but of course, if you have no power grid, you have no railway network, healthcare system, financial, all systems, you know, we depend so much now on the on the electricity and on the communication, so we could not, they could not uh, have in the, uh, the refrigerator, we didn't work. And the, a later event is also the cascading disaster in Japan, where the, uh, where the um, tsunami uh, destroyed the nuclear, nucle nuclear energy and then the electricity and then the the transportation, communication, all systems were cascading disaster. So we need, the sim we need a theory to study this. So I looked, I came and looked on the simplest theory that was done already uh, in, in 1959 by a pioneer who is Erdos, the, the, uh, the, the mathematic famous mathematician Erdos and Rainy student they solved this problem for a single network. It means you have a network, and they ask what happens if you have failures in this system. And if, uh, if the system does not fail, or P1 means all the nodes exist, all the nodes do not fail, then you have communication. This represents how many can communicate. One means the fraction can communicate, everyone can communicate to each other. You see, I can send an email from here to here, going from here, for it, going from here to here and then come back, come to here. So this system is fully connected. Now I start to remove, he asked the question, what happens if I start to remove a small fraction like 10% of the nodes randomly? When we remove this uh, fraction of nodes, he, he solved mathematically the fraction that still survive in the network. This was a breakthrough in 1959 by Erdos Raini, he found a mathematical formula, which is accurate. If you build this network and you, start, you, you can see how the network goes down. P1 means all functions, P.9 means that 90% are functioning, 10% are removed, and so on. And you see a, a beautiful a, figure, a, a graph that shows you how the number that can be uh, functioning, the fraction, can, which we call the, we call it the, the order parameter. We see a transition, phase transition. This is a phase transition in mathematics, not in physics. In mathematics, phase transition in graph theory. And he found everything, the formula, the, uh, the same was done for lattices. 
if P is uh, large, occupied, then the black one, you can, you can uh, go from everywhere to everywhere. But when you have P 0.5, you start to have a transition. Below it, you have islands, and you cannot go. For example, if this is a conductor, the black, then here you cannot have a, a conducting phase. And there was a lot of studies about uh, the phenomena. I will not go into detail about this. But now, if you take a simple problem, I wanted to take not one network, but to take more than one, which depends on each other. And this was my aim in the next step, which was done in 2010. This is the paper in nature that appears in 2010. Uh, instead of taking one network, and study it, we generalize the method, uh, we take uh, steps, more mathematical steps, to generalize it to network of such network, where the links depend on each other. This network depends on this, this depends on this, and vice versa. And we found a very general formula for, for N networks that depend on each other. It doesn't depend how they depend. It can be like this structure or this structure, but it's a very general formula, which reminds us the formula that Erdos and Rainey found in 59. And if you look on the difference between this and this, it's only the N. The N is the number of networks that you have in the, in the network of networks. But when N is one, if you have one, you get back the simple formula that was found say, almost uh, 65 years ago. So N changes the story. And when N is one, I get this solution that was found before. When n is two, we find new solutions. Instead of going continuous down, this, the, the number, the fraction that can communicate in the network, you start to have a jump from here, the solution, and the jump from here. And what is this jump cause? The jump is caused by, by the cascading failure that failures here because of dependency, lead to failure zero, and failure zero lead to failure zero, and here, and back. It means you have a feedback of failure that can exist in the system, which you did not have in this. This is because we introduced the dependency. Dependency, and this exists in, in real life. So why not to put it? And this gives us a new formula, which was published in this uh, set of papers. And, uh, and, uh, and not only that we see Another, uh, uh, we, we understand what is the abrupt transition. Abrupt means you come to this point and this, it, it can jump here. It means vulnerability increases significantly with N, and uh, if N is one, there is no almost vulnerability, because if I'm handling uh, uh, the power network, I don't care here if one or two more fail, because the network still survives. But here, if one fails more, it leads to cascading between the system and the system collapse. And this is what happens really in, uh, in real uh, uh, infrastructures. So now, but not only this phenomena, we, have, we looked also, since we have an analytical formula, we could look what happens during the abrupt. And we found new phenomena that people missed in the 100 years of studying phase transition. In the abrupt transition, what happens is it doesn't go uh, dramatically from here to here. It goes a little bit down and have a plateau, stays somewhere here. And during the plateau, you have microscopic chain, microscopic uh, failures from here to here. One failure here, little failure here, little failure here. And this is why we have a plateau in the giant component, in the, in the network. The network does not fall dramatically to here, but it stays long time. And this lock time has the properties of critical properties, which you can measure. Tau goes the time that it's in the plateau, goes how far you are from PC. And also, surprisingly, it goes like n to the one third, which means if the system is larger, the time this plateau is larger. Why? Because the microscopic uh, 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 feedback that you have, you need a long time in order to, to reduce the, the, the robustness of the system. So now I came to this experimentalist and I asked him and myself, can we realize and prove the theory of interdependent networks in controlled physical systems? It means to take in physics, to bring back network to physics. And this is very important 
because studying networks is easy. You don't need, you don't need so much uh, information about the system. It's a very simple system, but the phase transition is are very similar, and this is what I'm going to show you. So, so you can study networks and then discover new physics. And indeed, we found that if I take this system, like one superconductor here and one superconductor here, and connect it by, by thermal, uh, a thermal uh, uh, con uh, conductor and isolating the electricity, I can see phenomena that I see in networks. And indeed, we started the experiment on one layer alone. This is one layer and this is one layer. When you do one layer, even one layer is as a... This is the experiment of the superconductor. It means at low temperature, you can see each layer as a resistance zero. It means no, uh, no heat uh, is produced when we transfer electricity. And this one also zero. This is the theory. But what happens when we put a, in between a conducting a, a, a conducting heat material, but not a conducting, I mean, it's isolating for current. Current cannot move. Like the dependency, as I said. You have dependency and connectivity. The connectivity is the current here and the current here, and the dependency is if I have here a superconductor that become, become, uh, become a conductor, it must produce heat, and the heat can go to the other system. And indeed, when we go to when we go to uh, to uh, two networks, when I combine them together, instead of being a continuous transition, as in signal networks, as we saw in networks, you have abrupt transition. You see, it jumps. When I come here, it jumps down. When I go up here, there is also hysteresis. If you know what is this rises, and the theory is it. It means that by introducing a new interaction, a new interaction means interaction between the systems, between this system and this system, which is the new interaction, it's like dependency, but the heat, then you can introduce also abrupt transition. And now the question is, what happens to, to, um, to, the, to the other properties? As I told you, we have no, more than one property. We have also other properties like uh, the plateau, like the plateau in this transition. Can we see the plateau? And indeed, we see the plateau here, very nice in the experiment, that the system doesn't go down dramatically. It goes down. Actually, it was a, I came to the lab when the system was here, because look, it's 1,000 seconds. And, and he said, oh, 1,000 seconds is too much. The experimenter told me, too much. Why not to stop? Then I told him, no, wait, wait. And after 2000, we could see the abrupt change. It means that the system behaves very beautiful like the theory of, uh, of uh, interdependent networks. And you see here uh, one layer and the other layer, the plateau, like we had in the, in, the, in the system. And not only this, we can see that the change is like n to the one third. So we can introduce theory that we learn from, from network, which are abstract, no physics into physics, and we see this new phenomena. And what is this new phenomena? A new phenomena means that when, you, when I combine them together, I have microscopic changes. That's why the plateau. Plateau means the resistor doesn't change abruptly. It takes a lot of microscopic uh, uh, changes between the two systems until there is enough changes and the system collapses into. That's why it takes, uh, the time takes like the size of the system to the power of one third. So, is this the end of the story? The, it's not the end. The end is that we can also find a new phase. A new phase that did not exist in superconductors and exists now when we learn about the network. The, the, the theory that I showed you before was for uh, interdependent networks like this, where the dependency can be anywhere in the system. Now imagine that you can have dependency only in in some location up to a distance r. When you have this, you have a rich phase diagram like this, and when you have this regime, it depends on the r, you see this is r, how much they depend, how much the heat can go from here, you can see how much the heat can go in the other layer. If the heat can go everywhere, 
Then we get this transition, what I told you before. And here, uh, this is the single layer, but if you have a, if you have a R, you can see that you have a new phase diagram, which is superconductor, normal, and metastable superconductor. So let me uh, go to the summary. I think it's the end of this. Of, so summary and conclusions. So what I showed you is experimental proof of the theory of interdependent network. Interdependent networks are abstract geometrical structures. But now we can do it in experiment and we can see that you have actually a diagram that uh, you can see that the theory gives you. Uh, also, when you have two, you have abrupt changes in the, in the resistance. And uh, also back to physics, I came back to physics. I'm so happy that now I can speak about physics. And uh, also the origin, we can understand the origin, the mechanism, why it happens. I will not go, it depends on short range. As I told you, short range is when R is zero, we have continuous transition. Long range, we have uh, this type of transition, which we call mixed disorder. And then intermediate regime, we will have a new phase. This we did not see yet in the lab, but we are building in the lab to see this phenomena. And uh, so you see novel phase paradigm. The novel phase paradigm is a very interesting phase. It's a phase in which you can make intervention, microscopic intervention, and make a macroscopic phase transition. It means in this phase, in this yellow regime, I don't need to warm the system. I, need to, I can stay in, a, in the phase of superconductor, but I make heat in a small regime, in a very microscopic minor temperature, uh, minor change, and the system will go uh, spontaneously because it will, it will uh, develop further and further and will go to a macroscopic phase transition. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thanks a lot for a beautiful lecture indeed. Uh, there are a couple of people who have prepared some questions for you. Olat Mosk, where are you? Go oh, there. Thank you very much for a fascinating uh, lecture. Um, I would like to go uh, a small step back from physics and to the world-spanning societal networks, uh, where you've done some very interesting work. Uh, I, would, I would like to know uh, what kind of, of new co collaborations with, uh, with social scientists could be needed if we want to uh, describe for instance, phenomena like societal polarization that we see uh, in terms of network theory. Would you see an option for that? Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, I think uh, there might be uh, some uh, issues which are related to society because society becomes sometimes polarized also spont spontaneously, very fast. So it could be that if we make a theory for a type, two type of interactions in the society, this could lead also to such phenomena. This phenomena is very general. I can see it in physics, not only for superconductors, for any material, any, any phase transition that was done on a single system, if we combine them, it will be the same because the combination will lead. So why not to find also, not only in society, I believe also in biology you will see it. In many systems you will see it because usually you don't have single interaction. Single interaction was assumed in physics for many years. But if you have two type, or may, maybe even more, and this exists also in society. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, they're all sitting there. We could hear you. First of all, my uh, congratulations, Professor Havlin, for uh, the medal. And then uh, also your very nice talk. Um, in the Netherlands, we have actually a program, and uh, in particularly in Delft, I'm from Delft, sorry, which is <coughs> focusing in uh, quantum computers. We are actually trying to make the future quantum computer. And since your talk was on interconnecting superconducting layers by some coupling, which was heat, I was thinking, is there actually something in the theory that we can use in order to help or design a new, 
hardware infrastructure for future quantum computers based on interdependent networks. Thank you very much. Actually, quantum uh, uh, computers quantum are mostly based on superconducting. And the reason is because uh, in, in, in classical physics, we have bits. Bits can have two positions, zero or one, but not at the same time. Qubits, which we use in, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, in superconduct, in, super, in, uh, in quantum computing, are qubits which can have superposition of two states. It gives much more information than just a single state. I remember when I was a student, we had, uh, you know, the, the, we had the, the computer was so big because uh, we had to add uh, lumps for which zero and one, and uh, from this came the word bug. Bug means uh, some bug came to the lamp and uh, it burned, and then the whole computer building more than this building was, uh, could not function. So now we have them on atoms, and the, uh, in atoms you have, you have superposition, yeah, only when they are very cold, very at low temperature in the superconducting regime. So the superconducting regime is a very important regime for studying, for studying uh, f uh, quantum computers. And, uh, and indeed, what people used was usually this regime. This regime for the uh, transition because they, they talk on only on single layer. They took a single layer of atoms and, they, they, and each atom is like a computer, like a, a superposition of two states. If you look here, for example, in the yellow regime, you can have even higher temperature superconductors. Although they are not uh, stable, they are unstable, but, but if we don't uh, perturb them, they will be used also. So we have now a bigger range in which we can use the, the, the for quantum computers, we can have, use them as uh, the superconductor regime. More than that, uh, just a few days ago, I read an article in uh, Science, I think, or Nature. It was that we need to control, how to control the, the, the superconducting state. And indeed, here you may be able to control, because if you put a photon, you can switch on and off the superconductivity. And this is like a switch that can be done here. And, and this I learned only a few days ago, if you read the Nature article, they, they spoke about it. It means controlling the superconductor, the states, is very important in, so in, uh, computer, in, in uh, quantum computation. Thank you very much. Thank you. I thank the speaker once more. So now we're going to have a little break also for the people at home. Um, why don't we just uh, start getting back into the room uh, 15 minutes from now so that we can actually really convene again at 10 minutes, uh, at 16, uh, 40. Thank you.
Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome back to the second half of this afternoon. Uh, the first half, of course, was all about the Backhuis Rosenboom medal. The second half is going to be all about the uh, Gilles Holst medal. We're going to get the same exercises we had before the break. First, we're going to get a laudatio uh, by the chairman of the, uh, of the jury. Then we'll have the presentation of the medal, and then we'll have a lecture by the laureate. So please, can I invite you again? So, dear everyone again, it is my great pleasure to address the laureate of the Gilles Holst Medal 2023, Petra de Jong, um, Professor of Catalysts and Energy Materials at the De Beye Institute for Nanomaterial Science of Utrecht University. Um, as the chairman of the jury, I would like to say a few words on what convinced my fellow jury members, Jana Reutova, Hans Hilgenkamp and myself, that she should be the one to receive it. By the way, Petra uh, told me uh, ahead of this that um, she was a member of the jury the last time. So let's make sure that we uh, let uh, Hans and Jana know. I'm sure they will be interested in this fact. <laughs> Perhaps it is fair to say that what uh, Gilles Hols did for the incandescent light bulb, Petra de Jong is currently doing for the battery. Holst, in his time as the first director of the Philips Nut Lab, ensured that light bulbs became more efficient and had a longer lifespan. In doing so, he took a significant step in the global, ev global evolution of lighting. Petra, in turn, is at the forefront of a new generation of batteries that are safer, lighter, and more efficient. A crucial link to sustainable portable electronics and cars. So there is a parallel between the namesake and the laureate of the Gilles Holst Medal 2023. But let me not oversimplify because batteries are only one of Petra's interests. Her expertise spans many areas, including nanomaterials, heterogeneous catalysis, CO2 conversion, renewable energy, electrocatalysts, and sustainability. Notably, her research has delved deep into the role of catalysts in enabling efficient chemical conversions, which are pivotal in reducing energy consumption, minimizing raw material usage, and curtailing waste production. Using advanced spectroscopic methods, Petra studies the structure-reactivity relationship of catalysts, which paves the way to more efficient and more selective processes, for instance, for methanol, hydrocarbon, or ammonia synthesis, the key processes on the way to the circular economy. Many of Petra's groundbreaking insights were achieved thanks to materials that, due to the choice of components and structure, are very controllable and characterizable, yet can simultaneously be tested under realistic conditions for applications. This yields fundamental insights regarding the influence of, for example, particle size, pore structure, and the impact of interfaces on the electronic, optical, and catalytic properties of the nanoparticles. Again, like Kielis Holst, Petra has, been, has a keen nose for how fundamental academic science can be employed for practical applications. She brings together excellent academic research and sustainable applications with an effectiveness that is seldom seen among her contemporaries. Her 18 patent applications and numerous collaborations with innovative companies are a testament to this. Petra's research has always covered the interface between chemistry and physics. From her cum laude PhD on solar cells in a mixed chemistry physics group at Utrecht University, through the Philips Physical Lab, not lab, to her current position as the leader of a highly productive and diverse research group at the interdisciplinary De Beye Institute. She is aware that in order to make the transition to a climate neutral economy, we need even more disciplines than physics and chemistry. We live in exciting times, she said in an interview a few years ago, for we are transitioning towards a sustainable energy system at extremely high speed. And it is very confusing for some people, and it offers many challenges, not only technological, but also societal and political in nature. So we need all academic disciplines. 
I think this is very true, and it's a very wise thing to say, um, and we are confronted with that every day. But as we sit here this afternoon, we do our bit in finding answers to the technological challenges, which is exciting enough in itself. Petra, you are also the first woman to win the Gilles Holst medal, and it is about time. <laughs> As the jury, we are impressed by your work. It pushes the boundaries of scientific understanding and it paves the way for the real world solutions to some of our most pressing challenges. I now give the floor to our president, Marilyn Dochtrel. So that I don't make mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> Peter, van harte gefeliciteerd. Alsjeblieft. Die hoort er ook nog bij. Ja, shall I hold it for you? Chairman of the jury, also. And maybe. You can. Ah, nee, maar... Ik professor Dion, kan ik een vijfje toe mijn leiders? So I would like to start by thanking all of you for this very incredible honor, but specifically the KNAB. Uh, the chairman of the jury, the members of the jury for bestowing on me this honor, um, where I'm also following in the big footsteps, I would say, of some very famous uh, predecessors, of which I'm very happy to also see some of them in this audience today. Um, I don't think I can add much more to this beautiful laudatio, but let me try to at least tell you something about my research and my career path, um, which I entitles Beautiful Things Happen at interfaces. Um, and upon request of the KNOA, I will do most of my lecture actually in English, also in respect to Professor Havlin. But at the beginning, I will say a few words, general words in Dutch, and also at the end, I will say a few general words in Dutch. Um, I'm very honest with the Gilles Holst medal. Uh, veel dingen zijn er al over gezegd, maar een van de specifieke zaken daar is het grensvlak tussen natuurkunde en scheikunde. En daar voel ik mij bijzonder bij thuis. Daar ben ik bijzonder vereerd om daar te kunnen opereren. En Gillest Holst was inderdaad iemand die scheikunde, ammonia, methylchloride, uh, supergeleiding, so superconductivity in the lab of Heike Kameling Omnes. He also contributed to that. Um, maar hij is ook erg bekend omdat hij de allereerste directeur was van het NAT-lab, het natuurkundig laboratorium. Um, en het NAPLAB was een bijzondere plek en ik vind het ook enorm leuk om allerlei mensen van het NAPLAB hier toch weer in het publiek ook terug te zien. Um, hij begon daar in 1914 als uh, fysicus, als eerste directeur. En daar ligt al een eerste kleine link met mijn carrière, wat mij natuurlijk niet met hem kan vergelijken. Ik begon 85 jaar later, uh, en niet op 1 januari, maar 1 oktober, ook op het NAPLAB. Uh, in, waar op dat moment 2000 onderzoekers, veel technici, maar ook 600 academici, uh, met een ongelooflijke grote vrijheid op dat moment nog hun onderzoek deden. Maar laat me één stap terugnemen um, en eventjes vertellen over mijn studie in Utrecht um, en op mijn promotie in Utrecht. En ik vind het ook enorm fijn dat zowel John Kelly als Daniel van Makelberg, omdat zijn trein niet reed, daar links... Uh, allebei aanwezig zijn. Um, dit was een bijzondere groep. Het was een groep in het Debye Instituut uh, die half uit chemici en half uit fysici bestond. En ik voelde me daar onmiddellijk al thuis. Uh, mijn onderzoek zit u hier iets van. Uh, was eigenlijk fundamenteel ladingsdagerstransport in halfgeleiders, poreuze halfgeleiders. Uh, maar als toepassingsgebied zonnecellen. En het was gelijk al die combinatie van dingen, nanomaterialen. Iets heel fundamenteels, maar ook een relevante toepassing ergens uh, die mij in het onderzoek aansprak. En ik heb ongelooflijk veel geleerd van mijn promotor en mijn co-promotor. 
Um, ik bracht zelf de materialen, titaandioxide, nog steeds in onze groep, iets waar we af en toe naar kijken. Uh, en Daniel bedacht IMPS, Intensity Modulated for the Current Spectroscopy, waarmee we ladingsdragers uh, als gevolg van licht en nauwkeurgronden bestuderen. Uh, en dit bleek een hele mooie combinatie. Het is mijn allereerste artikel, Visref Letters, uh, 1996, samen met Daniel. Um, after that, I moved to the Philips Research Laboratories. Uh, this was a very specific place, and I'm always jealous of people that only have one topic and are able to research that for the rest of their lives. I'm, I'm always interested in almost everything, as people around me know, I'm always enthusiastic. Um, so you see some of the topics that I worked on there, but it also reflects the very special spirit that we had still at Naplat at that time. Uh, so it was really a place with an enormous amount of freedom, where you could basically follow all your crazy ideas, uh, let your creativity go. So I worked, as you see, on steam irons, beautiful light and frost effect, uh, thermochromic materials, semiconductors, battery materials. Um, and I think I took this sort of spirit with me to the rest of my career. Uh, keep an eye on for all sorts of applications, but also interested in all sorts of fundamental phenomena, and just see how things work out. Um, and then I started as a chair of Catalyst and Energy Materials at the Debye in the two th well, uh, 2004, I started at Utrecht University. Unfortunately, Professor Krein Jong is not here today, but I would really also like to thank him for the very great collaboration that we had all these years, uh, and I learned a lot. So let me show you my favorite research topic, which are nanomaterials. And I had to bit guess the exact size of the screen, but here they are on real size. <laughs> so you have to look really well. Uh, but I did enlarge them a bit for you. This is 1,000 times enlarged. I hope your eyes are good enough to see them. I did 5 million times enlarged. Uh, you see something appearing if you have good eyes. Uh, but we need electron microscopes to actually and re really visualize our, our, my topic of study. Um, and here you see what still interests me most, which is a nanomaterial, in this case a very small metal nanoparticle, um, at an interface with, in this, in this case is graphite, it's what we call a support. Um, and this is a nanomaterial, and one of the most important things of nanomaterial is actually that there's very few normal atoms that are part of the normal material, and actually many of them are somehow at an interface. An interface with another material, or an interface with a gas phase or a liquid phase or even vacuum if you want. Um, so most of the atoms in nanomaterials, if you make particles of maybe five nanometer or two nanometer, many of the atoms are actually somewhere at the surface and have very different properties than what you normally know. Um, and the classical example is always gold. So everybody knows gold. Uh, it is a very noble metal. Uh, it melts at, well, for the physicist, 1337 Kelvin, for the chemist in the room, 1064 <laughs> degrees Celsius. And these are properties that you think you know. But if you make things small, they can amaze you. And they can amaze you in three different ways. And the most classical ways, and this is a very classical uh, research result of uh, Borel from the 80s, uh, a very classical thing is that if you make them smaller, so here you go from 30 nanometer to, well, maybe 5 nanometer, 2 nanometer, a lot of properties change in a very predictable, understandable, scalable manner. Uh, because there are so many atoms at the surface and they give it very, I would say, unstable properties, it means that, for instance, the melting point goes down from the melting point you see here to actually a very, very low melting point uh, for very small particles. <coughs> This we understand, this we can predict, this we can calculate. And two important factors there is the surface energy, which you see here, which is the gamma, and the R, which is the radius, so it's the size of the nanoparticle. Some things are a bit more complicated and amazing. And when you see here illustrated, and yes, he's also somewhere in the audience, I think there's a picture of Jesse van der Hoeve. Um, gold nanoparticles, if you make them small, they're not the gold color that we know, but they can get all sorts of different colors. Um, another thing you see here is that nanoparticles are intrinsically very unhappy, very unstable, and you need to stabilize them with something to be able to do something with them. Uh, and this might be in a solution as a colloid with some organic ligands, but my favorite topic of study is solid materials, and you see here gold nanoparticles visualize an electron microscope in a porous structure that makes them stable and allows you to handle them. 
This is relatively well understood, relatively well described, surface plasma resonances. Uh, but there are many things there that we do not understand at all yet and cannot calculate. And one of them is catalysis. Here are very small gold nanoparticles in a reaction which is CO oxidation to CO2. And only if these particles are extremely small, they become catalytically active, and we're still debating why exactly. And you can think of many different effects that play a role at this small scale. Um, another thing here is that you see is not just the gold and the particle size, but it's also the interface. So these are called nanoparticles of the same size, but supported on different oxides. So the interface, the solid-solid interface, is with a different oxide. If you take titanium dioxide, actually they're very fast. If you take an innocent inert, as we call it, oxide like silica, actually they don't do much. So it's not even just the size and the type of material, but also the interface that you create with other materials. And this is not work by me, it's work by, uh, well, actually Haruta and Hutchins were the first to discover that gold could be very active and reactive if you made it small enough. Uh, but we also did some very nice experiments in the lab to show, so these are the gold nanoparticles, these bright dots, and you see here also the oxide as a support. Um, and we showed that it's interesting from a fundamental point of view that if you have titania, it's actually very good, and you get a material that's very active. But there the practical side from Philips came back, and I thought, okay, but what if we do not do that for five seconds, like people normally do, or but we just wait like almost a day? And then you see, yes, initially it might be great to put it on this interface, but if you wait a bit longer, actually the boring silica is outperforming this exciting titanium support. So it has much more to it um, than just even this interface effects that we understand to some extent. So, um, yeah, I, there was mentioned batteries and energy transition, so you might say, yeah, fascinating, these nanomaterials, but what do they actually have to do with the energy transition? We don't see it yet. Um, well, I'll explain you in three slides. Um, this is or was our current society. So we have fossils, and for gammas they're beautiful, because we have a solid, a liquid, and a gas with an enormous energy content, impossible to beat, very low cost, and they can provide us with the three things that we do need in society. One is electricity, about a quarter, and it is increasing, goes to electricity, fuels, the majority we use for fuels, and then a relatively small percentage actually goes to chemicals, chemical building blocks to the industry. And this is what we have to beat, and it's extremely hard. Um, but these are the three things that we need, just keep that in mind. So what do we have in renewable resources to beat that? Solar, wind, <coughs> biomass perhaps, a bit, and maybe circularity, waste. Uh, but these are very different systems from the fossils. And one main thing is that our main supplies of energy provide electricity. They're not a solid, they're not a liquid, they provide electricity. And this gives you a lot of problems. They're not providing you fuels, they're not providing your chemical building blocks. Electricity, everybody might have heard of hydrogen as the key factor for the energy transition. Hydrogen is the easiest fuel that you can make with electricity from water. Still not so simple on a very large scale. And then the problems start a bit because neither electricity nor hydrogen are easy to store. So my oil or my coal, I can put it in a bucket and I can put it in my backyard. No way I can put a lot of electricity or hydrogen in my backyard anywhere in a bucket. Um, and then you'd like to make these fuels and chemicals. Preferably in a circular manner, so from waste or from CO2 that we capture from the air. And how are we going to do this? Well, this can only be done by nanomaterials. All of these transitions, energy storage, conversions, have to be facilitated by nanomaterials. Mostly catalysts, but also batteries, storage materials, nanomaterials. So we need to find them, we need to develop them, we need to make them efficient enough to sustain this. Good. So this is basically my research in just one slide. These are nanomaterials, hundreds of square meters per gram. I showed you their beautiful properties, but also you need them because all of the processes I just showed take place at the interface, which means at the surface here of these nanomaterials. So you make things very small to have a lot of material for something to happen. And this could be catalysis, this can be gas sorption. Uh, you can convert electricity or you can convert sunlight 
for instance, to fuels, uh, and you can make also battery materials. And I'll show you a few examples of them. Let's start by the beginning. This is what I started at Utrecht University when I came back, hydrogen storage materials. So I would like to store hydrogen in a small material. I have a metal and I put hydrogen, I make a metal hydride and I can get it back out. And it was then a very nice fundamental challenge because you'd like to have a lot of hydrogen in your material and you'd like the thermodynamics to be such that you can get the hydrogen in and out, not so much above room temperature. And it's just very bad luck that actually none of the materials that we could make in the periodic table ended up in this green triangle of high mass and the right temperature. And this is just bad luck. It's not a, a law of nature. And the first thing we thought about is, can we somehow change these materials by making them very small and change their properties to get them to move into this triangle? And this was the very first thing I did in Utrecht. Um, and really, Wagemans, my very first PhD, is somewhere in the audience, and you might recognize this paper. This was my first paper in Utrecht University. What happens if you make, for instance, magnesium, very small particles, can you get them to get into the green triangle? Theoretically, you can, but it took, well, me and Rudy uh, and Tamara, who's also in the audience, a lot of pain to actually make particles which were small enough, just one nanometer. Very beautifully researched, very useless, because these particles were so small, they were so unstable, we could not use them for anything, but they led to a very nice patent, together with Shell, to actually make this type of very small materials, also for different purposes. Um, then I can't put a phase diagram here, well, a different one. Um, then I was looking at more composite materials, and I thought, okay, what happens if I take this phase diagram and I make it very small and I put it in nanopores? And then the interfacial energies will make sure that all your solid lines in your phase diagram are shifting. Uh, but here we could not predict how, because the interfacial energies were not known as well at all. And we had to measure that, and we measured a beautiful phase diagram, which was absolutely moving in the wrong direction in terms of temperature. Third attempt, lithium boron hydride, and also Peter <coughs> and Danis, somewhere in the audience, confine it into nanopores of just a few nanometer. And this is a very fascinating material because it has two phases, a normal temperature phase, but above 110 Celsius, a temperature phase which is very conductive in terms of ions. Um, and we thought maybe we can shift this phase transition to room temperature and make it a good battery. And this is colorimetry, you can measure phase transitions. Here was the normal one. And indeed you can shift phase transitions by hundreds of degrees by confining it uh, in a small uh, matter. And this was nice, um, but we saw something very strange. And here I think my Philips nature came back because we were looking at a hydrogen storage material, but what I saw was lithium ions moving around like madness at room temperature. And I thought, hey, this is worthless for hydrogen storage, but what about lithium ion batteries, solid state lithium ion batteries? Um, so we investigated, we jumped up on that, and we started in the group, which was actually Catalysis Group, we started a battery team, and I'm very happy that Peter is now heading this battery team in our group. And we found that if we confine materials to a few nanometer size, you can gain orders of magnitude ion conductivity at room temperature, which is a great base for lithium ion batteries. Okay, so I think part of the message is that you're often looking for something, but you need the freedom in research to explore, to be just driven by your curiosity, and to have a very open eye for whether something might be useful, maybe for something completely different. And this started the battery research in our group. Um, I'd like to spend the last part on catalysis, because catalysis for me is really where things meet. Um, for the energy transition, we need catalysts. For the energy transition, just to make sure, we need also very large scale transition. So we also need the companies that are able to make fuels at a very large scale. And these are the present energy companies that have the people, the knowledge and the infrastructure to make the energy transition happen. But catalysis for me means also that physics is meeting chemistry. Because I have a metal surface, I have all the electronic properties and the wave functions sticking out of the surface, and then I come with a molecule. And I'm not a molecular scientist, so I prefer the molecules to be as simple and small as possible, but you have a molecule that actually needs to be transferred to something else, converted to something else. That is catalysis. Um, 
And just as an overview, Catalysis is most of my life nowadays, my scientific life, so I'm interested in really fundamental things like tuning the electronic properties or tuning the, the particle size and seeing what happens. But I'm very proud that in our lab we investigate that for very relevant applications. And you see here a little impression of our catalysis lab. Uh, I'm very proud of it. We test all the major relevant reactions I think that we have. Um, and it's not built by me, but it's built by the technicians, of which I'm very happy to see some in the audience today as well. Um, back to particle size. This is particle size. And this is basically how good is a catalyst per kilogram of metal, or if you want, per euro in this case. And you see some very strange things. So you see, for instance, here silver for ethylene epoxidation. And a very specific size, particle size, is very good. If you go to larger particles, you're actually wasting the silver. Because the larger the particle, the less surface I have. So you see here a 1 over d relationship. If particles are large, they become inert. If they're small, they get more and more active. But then very strange things happen at the smaller sizes. And this really depends on the metal. It depends on the reaction, it depends on the conditions. And honestly, although some things are understood there, many things are not understood as well. So it's a very important research topic in our group. Um, and I want to show two examples. I'm very happy that Suzanne managed to get in. Suzanne is almost finishing her thesis, but these are some results from uh, Suzanne Schoemaker, Tom Belling, and also Dan. Um, I'll show you two examples of particle size effects. This is a particle size effect where we take natural gas, methane, and we do not burn it to produce CO2, but we want to decompose it. And then we get hydrogen as a clean fuel, not emitting CO2, only water when you burn it. And we get carbon products, which means that you can form useful carbon products forming hydrogen from natural gas. And this is a collaboration that is also done with uh, at least uh, Shell and BASF as companies that are very interested in this type of processes. Um, you see effects of temperature, of particle size. What we actually measure is how much carbon we make, and hence also how much hydrogen we make, as a function of time. And you see that sometimes you have a very fast reaction, but it stops very quickly. And sometimes you have a sort of optimum where you can grow much longer, and your catalyst lifetime is much longer. And one of the reasons that I'm proud to show this is because this is one of the very first that we got working in our lab in an electron microscope. So you saw how small nanoparticles are. We need an electron microscope to see them, but to perform a chemical reaction in an electron microscope and visualize it is really, I think, very spectacular. Um, so we have an electron microscope. So you see here a scale of 200 nanometer. You see here a catalyst, which is carbon with nickel copper particles on it, very small. So the dark dots are very small particles. And you will see this reaction happening because over the small particles, we, we will decompose methane natural gas, so you don't see it, into hydrogen, also gas, so you won't see it, but a solid product, which is the carbon, which makes that we can really visualize this reaction. And you see here many things happen. A can of worms was what Tom called it. <laughs> so you see, you really visualize the reaction where these catalyst particles, these small dark metal dots, are growing carbon fibers, carbon nanotubes in different ways. And it's amazing because you can now not just look at the overall result, but on a very small scale, actually see what is happening with this catalyst. And you can even zoom in a bit if you want, if I manage. Yes. So here you see really, for instance, this is a lo relatively large particle, which very grow very slowly with facetive <coughs> growth. Here is a speedier one. Also, the carbon structures that they grow are different. And if you have a bit of patience, you'll see a sort of speedy Gonzalez jumping out of the here somewhere. Not yet. Where is it? One, two, three. Yes, there. <laughs> uh, and this is so interesting because it allows you to basically do like 500 experiments at the same time and at the nanoscale during the reaction, look at what is happening with your catalyst. So you can analyze this, and there's a lot of science coming out. I will not go into the details. But I'd like to show you also a second example, which is related to CO2 circularity. So if we want at the end to make fuels, we probably, so fuels are hydrocarbons. So they contain carbon and hydrogen. The hydrogen we can get from electrolysis. This is not so difficult. You need a carbon source. And the carbon source might be waste, might be from biomass. 
It might also be from capturing CO2 from the air and bringing it back into fuels. But it's not so easy if you have a mixture of hydrogen and CO or hydrogen and CO2 to make really good fuels out of that. Uh, this is just thermodynamics. As a function of temperature, you have to go to, well, normally reactions you run at at least a few hundred degrees Celsius, otherwise they're not fast enough, uh, but you still have a lot of CO2. You can make methane, natural gas, but you do not see the valuable products that you're looking for, like methanol. It's not even thermodynamically something that in equilibrium you could make, and CO only at very high temperatures. And still, you would like to make one product that you really would like to have. And there you need this catalyst, these nanoparticles. If you put iron or cobalt, you make liquid fuels. If you put nickel, you make natural gas. If you put copper, you normally will make methanol. You need other things to make CO. And from these building blocks, you can also make all other things you'd like to make. Um, and one of the... Yeah, things that so I can talk about this for hours or days or weeks if you want. I, I'm always very happy to talk about catalysis, but I'll just show you one recent example which is related to particle size effects. Uh, so you see here surface averaged copper particle size of nanometers, and you see basically the activity, the intrinsic activity, each surface atom of metal, how often per second does it convert CO2 into something useful? And you see that this is indeed dependent on particle size. Uh, and this is one of the things that we start to understand now. And also it depends on what you make. So the different particle sizes might be better if they're larger for making CO, or they might, might be, if they're smaller, better for making methanol. And this is something that at least partially we start to explain now. Because if you look at these particles, it's not like the spheres that I showed so far, but they are normally faceted. And all these facets have different electronic properties. And that means that all of them have different catalytic properties. So much, many of the particle size effects that we do know can actually be explained by the occurrence or the fraction that we have of the different facets on a metal nanoparticle. And I was very excited because, ah, look, you can be twice as fast with the, with the particle if you have the right size, uh, really nice. But let me introduce you to my latest hobby or my future hobby, I would say. Um, what happens if you have a metal nanoparticle, a small metal <coughs> nanoparticle, and you try to modify its properties by what we call a promoter, which means you put something else, electropositive or electronegative, or a certain oxide, you put it there and you see what it does with catalysis. And I just illustrated with this graph, this is the poor copper particles that we just saw, not bad catalysts, but if you add something to it, another element, zirconia, zinc, manganese, you see that it suddenly becomes orders of magnitude more active. It can make suddenly different products. And here we're really quite stuck because we understand actually very little yet. And why do we understand very little yet? Um, well, it needs a lot of catalytic power to look at what is happening with the reaction. There are some classical theories which relate to donating electron density. For instance, some trends, this is Ertel, so it's a long time ago. But it holds beautifully on an atomically flat surface in absolute vacuum when I put one atom of potassium there. But it breaks down completely when you talk about real applications with high pressures and gases. Um, and not uh, a metallic potassium, but a potassium oxide. Uh, and there is still an enormous amount to discover. And I think we can do that now. And this is my latest last slide. I think we can do that now because quite recently we are able to study also under real conditions, at an accelerator, on the atomic scale, what actually is happening there and what, uh, what the structures are that we are measuring uh, while doing catalysis. So I think electron microscopy, atomic measures at the moment under reaction conditions are going to tell us the answers. So the very last slides are to thank some people. Um, research is not possible without funding, and I'm very happy to have a lot of different funding organizations, some that give an enormous freedom to discover what I'd like, some that give a lot of freedom to discover what I like, some of them maybe a bit less. Um, but it's not possible to do research without all these collaborations. Um, and the other ones I'd like to thank my group, which is largely represented here, scattered in the audience, the Materials, the Chemistry and Catalysis Group, I'm extremely grateful to the Debye Institute, to Allard, to Alphonse, to Andries, 
who nominated me uh, for this prize and who have been, Dubai has been a scientific home for me for 25 years. It always exists 35 years, but 25 years it has been my scientific home. But also to the Department of Chemistry and the head who's sitting on the first row, Stefan Rudecker, uh, for supporting this nomination. Uh, our Dean, Isabel Arends, sitting there in yellow-green, who makes it possible for us as researchers <coughs> to do the nice research that we do in the Faculty of Science. Um, not to forget the ones on the first row, uh, my family, dus Detlef, Mette en Sanne, um, mijn vrienden die ook voor een deel hier aanwezig zijn in de zaal, um, mijn ouders hier op de eerste rij, zonder wie ik er niet zou zijn. Uh, wetenschap doe je samen met wetenschappers, maar ook met de mensen om je heen. Dank jullie wel. Kan je nog even blijven staan? Ja. <laughs> nee, nee. <laughs> Goed. Um, ook voor jou, also for you, there are a couple of questions uh, prepared. Uh, Andries Meijerink. Thank you, Peter, for a beautiful and inspiring talk. Very much in the spirit of Gilles Holst, showing how curiosity different fundamental research beautiful research can be linked to very relevant applications. My question is about something that you mentioned a few times, you don't really understand it, the size dependence. Often for nanoparticles, it seems to be an optimum size. And you also mentioned that facets could play a role. Um, my question is, could electronic effects also play a role? If facets are the, playing the role, then could you make smaller crystals with the same facet exposed to increased activity? And how do theoretical calculations support your ideas. So thank you, Andries, for three questions in one. Um, uh, you, you asked three questions, eh? <laughs> I have three more, yes. <laughs> that makes nine. Three keer three is negen. Um, um, okay, so the facet, yes, we do understand. So I put here this picture, and you see some generalized coordination numbers. We did calculations for this reaction of all the intermediate adsorption strengths of the intermediates of the products of the, the starting, and we start to understand adsorption strengths of molecules and hence transition energies from the different ones, and we can start to explain the facets now. Only recently, I would say, by computational chemistry. I'm very happy also Nong is in the group, who's a staff scientist in our group doing computation. Um, electronic effects do play a role. Uh, they do play a role, usually we say, around two nanometer and below. And interestingly, you see that many of these catalysts actually stop working around two nanometer, except the very few exceptions, which are uh, the more heavy ones, like gold, platinum, palladium, on very polar substrate. And then you get electronic effects also of the substrate. Um, and then they might do something interesting. But for these reactions, like with hydrogen or oxygen, we actually see that most things stop working when you make them too small. Uh, and it has everything to do with the fact that you have so low coordinated atoms at the surface that they bind something very strongly and never let go. And then nothing happens anymore. And I forgot the third question. What was it? If it is the facet, if you make very small particles uh, with the right facet. Ah. Yeah, so it, it's of course interesting, for instance, to make colloidal plates or triangles or cubes. And yes, this initially might make some difference, but please remember that what we do in, under any useful circumstances is a few hundred degrees. And these are metal particles. And I did not show the movie, but they are almost liquid-like. So although on average this is the facet or the coordination, they're changing all the time. And if you make a triangle, for sure it will not be a triangle after or during your catalysis under these conditions. Thank you. Very good. Stefan Rüdiger. Yeah, it's, 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 it's very fascinating, Petra, how you, um, how you actually can control the size of your particles to, to increase the yield. Um, I, I wonder now, looking forward, can, um, can, can you actually now move towards metals which are actually cheaper or actually more environmental compatible, such as, for example, iron? And could, is it, do you see that it would be possible to, for example, um, uh, tune the shape of the particles, just that not only the size, but also the shape could, a certain shape could increase the efficiency of a catalyst? 
Again, this is not just one question, but... Um, <laughs> and I have only asked this. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I always show my students this periodic table, which I like, which is from the European Chemical Society, and shows you basically which elements are abundant and which we have to be careful with. And indeed, things like copper, cobalt, gold, definitely are the ones we have to be careful with. I'm not extremely bothered about it. I mean, uh, all combustion cars also have things like platinum, palladium, more than one gram. Um, if things are very rare and very uh, expensive, we usually recycle them. And catalysts are very easy to recycle. I mean, you don't throw them away if you're using these metals. I mean, we have quite some industrial people also somewhere in the audience. Um, but most of them, if they're worthwhile, if there's cars, you recycle them. Uh, and this is part of the answer. So it's not that you use them in the term of gebruiken, that they're gone afterwards, but you can use them and then reuse them as well. Um, so I'm not very worried, but of course you should not use something which is so rare that it's yeah, almost impossible to get, but that doesn't go for most of the things. So iron is great, but iron is only a catalyst for very specific things because it's a very non-noble metal to form carbides and oxides. Um, it's not the most useful one. Um, and the second question was about shape, and I'm a bit answering to Andri. So if you do a reaction under extremely mild conditions and very, very slowly at room temperature, which you normally would not do in industry, because, yeah, you have to wait eternally to get something, then you might have very nice shapes that you can keep as they are. As soon as you do catalysis, as I do it, under high pressure and high temperatures, any unstable, totally out of equilibrium shape will not be there anymore when you do catalysis. As soon as you start it, it will be gone. And I'm almost sorry I didn't bring the, a very nice movie that we have of a real catalyst where you see also this part, but you saw a bit of particles moving already. They get almost liquid-like because their surface also is, is reacting all the time. Will it rearrange? You need this mobility to get, good, to get the action. So it's a nice idea, but only in more, uh, let's say, academic settings. I think this works well. And indeed, we did see beautiful movies. But okay. Yes, but not this one. <laughs> okay, let's congratulate the laureate once more. <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you enjoyed this afternoon as much as I did. And I just want to invite you now to have a chat together while having a drink and to congratulate, indeed, in person, the laureate. Thank you.